Yeah, uh, thank you so much for coming. That is my first talk on an event like this. I'm very excited about this, and hopefully you find it useful. Uh, so I'm from Matthew University. The second affiliation you see there is SINS. You've probably never heard about SINS, Software Innovation New Zealand, a network of uh, New Zealand academics doing research in software engineering, programming languages, and security, if you want to have a look at this. So um, if, you, if you attended the preview session by Felix, is Felix in the audience? See, no, that's Felix. Not it here. Yeah, okay. So he already gave an introduction, and I think naturally what I do in the beginning overlaps to some extent, so I apologize uh, for this in advance. We, both talks are about very, very related topics indeed. So what is serialization? So what you want with serialization, you want to take complex data structures, write them onto a stream, and then recover them from the stream. And you want to do it in a way that's the structure of those complex data structures so in particular, an object in the language we're talking about objects, so the objects and their references stay the same. So you want to preserve the topology. And there are many reasons you want to have this in particular as an enterprise developer. So one is for object promoting, and the history of this goes back a long way. Remote procedure call, but particular COBA had a protocol like this, a binary protocol, to export objects, let's say from a Java or small talk program, read it into a C++ program, and the topology and the data were retained. Uh, while doing so. Persistence is another use case for this, and the third use case is kind of less known, and that is uh, so serialization is actually a clever way of cloning objects, of doing transparent, deep clones, but just serializing in a memory structure and then reading it back from, the, from a buffer. And because of the serialization is really, really popular, and all major languages have some sorts of support for this. There are language-independent protocols. I already mentioned IOP, COBA a newer version of this is protocol buffers, and then you have uh, language-specific protocols like Java binary serialization and marshalling and Ruby and so on and so forth, and you have binary formats as well as XML, JSON, YAML, whatever your uh, character encoding of the day is, uh, formats as alternatives. Um, what you really want as a developer from a good serialization framework is magic, right? You want, to be, you want the serialization to be completely automated, and don't want to worry about this. Unfortunately, there are certain limits to this. And to explain this, let's consider another feature you want to have in a, in a reasonable programming language, and that's data structures such as hash maps, or you might call them hash tables or dictionaries. You need them for fast you know, indexing, lookup, because of con constant time lookup and writes to those data structures. So it's really kind of a, a, a core building block of modern computing. So now, a hash table has objects organized by their hash codes. The hash codes really tell you in which bucket you store the object within the data structure. Now, if you deserialize the data structure, you have to reestablish this information. You have to rebuild those so-called buckets, you know, the index inside this hash data structure. And to do this, you need to ask objects, what is your hash code? And now you could argue, well, an easy way of doing this is just to compute this before deserialization and just save this data onto the stream as well. But that has problems because uh, the hash code function is usually provided by a programmer because uh, only the programmer knows what part of the state goes into the hash, right? But if the programmer doesn't really implement this, you need some sort of default. And in Java, the way you do this, you just look at the memory location and compute a hash from the memory location. But now the memory location in the old system you used when you, do, when you serialize the objects, is that information is not very useful in your new system. You have a completely different memory layout. So for this reason, you have to compute this during the process of deserialization. And what I really wanted to say with this is I wanted to provide a good example of why you need this kind of computational hooks or callbacks in the deserialization process. When you read objects, you have to build in some sort of mechanism to call custom functions, and computing the hash code is one good example for this. So, unfortunately, that creates opportunities to attack systems that use this mechanism. And that has been known for quite a while, but in particular, like two or three years ago, there was an outburst of attacks on this space. Uh, in particular, people like Chris Forhoff and Gab Lawrence first pointed out that languages like PHP, Java, Python are very vulnerable to this, and then people had a closer look into some of the Java frameworks and Java application servers that are widely used, and figured out that they're all prone to those vulnerabilities. And uh, that is really how those attacks work. So read object is the callback in Java. I just use Java as an example. I talk about other languages a little bit later. 
And when you uh, now read a stream, you call the read object method. The read object method calls functions like hash code. And then under the assumption that you have a library like Apache Commons collections into your class path, which apparently most programs do because it's a very widely used commodity library, then you find a data structure in here that basically works as follows. You have still a map, but your map does not have complete key value information for all possible keys. But if you don't find a value for a key, you have a function to compute it if you need it, right? And uh, at the time, Java didn't have lambdas, so the good people from the Apache Foundation came up with their own type of lambdas called transformers. And one of those transformers was a transformer that basically stored in its state, or was able to access in its state, a string that was interpreted as method name, and then the method was executed. So you go from here through this library into the Java reflection framework, and once you have reflection, you can actually uh, call runtime execute, which allows you to execute arbitrary functions on the, on the platform, on the operating system. So again, it's kind of remarkable that most application servers are really prone to this, because it turns out that most application servers, as well as applications, use this library. So Java, as many other platforms, really developed into a rich ecosystem. We have so many libraries, and almost all programmers use almost all libraries that are there, or almost all mainstream libraries. So at the moment, we do a study on the Alfresco framework, which some of you might know, that uses 300 different libraries. And actually, all libraries have substantial size, much bigger than JavaScript libraries, for instance. So the question we ask ourselves now, is serialization also prone to a denial of service attacks? And uh, you could rephrase this. At the time, we thought, if people try to tackle this kind of vulnerabilities by basically creating safer deserialization frameworks that somehow checks the types to be deserialized, because that is a very obvious way to protect yourself against this particular attack. So in the deserialization process, you just look which types are being deserialized or instantiated from the stream data. And if you find something that comes from this library, you just say, no, I throw an exception, I abandon mission, because that's, I, I know that there's something unsafe in there. And that's this blacklist approach. You can go one step first and just create a type whitelist. And that basically makes this kind of attack uh, impossible, right? So the question we ask ourselves is, if you actually do this, is serialization or rather deserialization, does it become safe? And so what we looked for is, can deserialization be used to create types of vulnerabilities or types of attacks that uh, are basically denial of service or the creation of service attacks, whereas the attack itself doesn't really lead to remote code execution, but to the exhaustion of computational resources on the side of the program that deserializes. And computational resources here means stack, heap, and CPU. You could also talk about hard drive space, for instance, that would be uh, closely related. And once you think about this, it's very, very easy to come up with the first example. And the first example we created here uh, we called it turtles all the way down. If, if you like Terry Pratchett, you would, know, you would know why. And that is a simple Java program that actually creates an object, and that is a payload which you save into the stream. So if that gets saved onto a stream and then deserialized using the built-in binary Java serialization mechanism, you're running into a stack overflow. So the reason for this is you have a map here, you have a list in the map, and then you add the list to itself. And the Java API, as well as all other major language APIs that do this, actually allow you to do so. And if you think about this, it actually makes sense, because how can you control it? You know, it's a short cycle. But you could build, even if that was not allowed, you could build a deeper structure that just runs through large cycles and basically still do the same thing. So that is perfectly fine. Um, the program that deserializes is prepared for all sorts of issues. For instance, Java compiler forces it to handle I.O. exceptions because the stream comes from the outside and you might unplug the network cable, right? You are protected against this, or if the compiler forces you to protect yourself against this, but not against stack overflow. So that already creates major problems for real-world Java programs. So, okay, so that is the reference. I'm not quite sure how widely that is known. That is Bertrand Russell. He was a philosopher who looked into the foundation of mathematics about 100 years ago. And he figured out that if you have sets and you don't restrict how you can build sets, and you can build sets of sets, then the foundations of mathematics collapse. It's called Russell's paradox, if you want to have a look at this. Yeah? It's, uh... So it's hardly surprising that we get vulnerabilities in this space. So 
The second type of attack is really on the CPU. So it's a computation or a trigger for computations that takes a very long time. And that was crafted after an older attack called uh, Billion Laughs. And if we were in Felix's session, you already talked about this. It's an XML document. It has entity reference here. And the entity is defined using first entity references. And then you just get this combinatorial explosion. So you have 10 of those, 100 of those, 1,000 of those, 10,000 of those, and so on and so forth. And with a very tiny XML document, if you parse it, you suddenly have a billion laughs, yeah? a billion uh, lols. So that was an attack on a parser. And of course, what you can see here can relatively easily actually prevent this attack by just using a parser that uses dynamic programming. So instead of recomputing, let's say, lol8 again and again, you just compute it once, and then you cache it. So with dynamic programming, you can actually relatively easily solve this. So a security consultant called Walter Kirkhardt uh, last year, or uh, sorry, two years ago now, ported this to Java and created actually a Java payload that basically does the same thing and creates uh, an, an object structure that also gets the same combinatorial explosion. Without understanding each line of code, there's a certain depth to the structure, which I set here to 100. And at each layer, I create two new hash sets and add them to the previous layer. There's one more thing here. I add the string foo to each hash set. And the reason is just that if you add two elements, they have to be different. Otherwise, otherwise hash sets just identify them and just add one of the elements, right? So. <coughs> Excuse me. I think that makes actually more sense to look at it like this. So we have the sets we create at each layer. This underscore number is really the uh, situation we are in currently. And we get this cross references here. If you now call hash code at the top of the structure, the so hash code of a Z is constructed by looking at the element, taking the hash codes of all elements, and then computing it using a special function from the hash code of all elements. So again, you get this common total explosion, because once you have computed it, you digit from the stack. And you repeat, in the next cycle, you, you repeat the computation. So you get this common total explosion in the call tree. If you do an analysis, which we did, those are the formulas here. So the number of invocations at a certain depth. So the depth is what goes into your structure. is 5 times 2 to the power of depth minus 1. You start getting in trouble in the high 20s. So on my MacBook, if I run this at a depth of 30, it takes over a minute and then almost exactly doubles with each further increase in the depth of the structure. And yeah, I said this really bad news. If you do it with a depth of 100, as originally anticipated by Walter Kirkhurst, then uh, it takes longer than the, than, the, than the age of the universe to deserialize the structure. So that is actually really, really bad news. Keep in mind here that the, that the file is still tiny. It's still just at most a few kilobytes, because we are talking about 50 or 60 objects. That is tiny. 50, 60 objects serialized as a tiny file, right? So in a way, Again, coming back to turtles all the way down, we went from this kind of linear structures, turtles all the way down to this kind of structures, which is more like a recursive pyramid. So next question we ask ourselves is, can we actually craft a similar attack on the heap? And, and the answer is yes, and we call this pufferfish for the obvious reasons. So the object craft topology is very, very similar to serial doors. But a couple of things have to be done differently. So the key insight here is that the two-string implementation in Java is also recursive and un unchecked by size. What it means is if you have, let's say, a list in Java and you say, my list dot two-string, if you don't program in Java, two-string is just a Java stringify, you know, like two underscore assets called in langu some languages. General utility to turn objects into strings, and you need this everywhere for debugging, for instance, you need this. So you call this on a list. It takes it to string representations of all elements and nicely chains them together, separated by a comma, and puts some brackets around this. What is surprising about this is that it never checks for the size of the resulting string. You would assume if the string becomes really, really big, it does something like opening bracket, element one to string, element two dot string, comma, dot, dot, dot. But it doesn't really do anything like this. It creates strings of arbitrary size. So that is the first insight. What you still have to find now is uh, what the community calls a trampoline. So a trigger where from deserialization you jump into the execution of two string. So how can we trigger collection to string from a read object? Uh, that is very, very technical. But it gives you a good insight how 
Java APIs, or APIs in all similar languages actually design what they try to achieve and how they sometimes fail to achieve this. And the object we use as a payload is actually an exception that can be serialized. It's called a bet attribute value expression exception, and it holds a reference to an arbitrary object. It has an API that is very, very controlling. So for instance, with the constructor, as a constructor, it tries to make sure that the object you inject into this is either a string or a numerical value, and if not, it actually throws an exception. However, that doesn't really bother us, because with reflection, we just bypass the API. We bypass the precondition checks, and we undermine the invariance of this respective class. You know, so we just craft the heap using reflection. And then we have a very, very similar structure. At each layer, we add a zero and a one, and you can see where that is going. We get this combination of all zeros and, and, and ones at a certain depth, so we again have exponential growth, but this time in size, right? So that is the structure, the object structure here. At each stage, we have references to zeros and ones, and the core graph just keeps on creating this very large strings if you call to string. Here's the analysis of the structure. So the size at a certain depth is two to the depth plus three minus five. Size at 26 is over a gigabyte, and from there on almost exactly doubles with each additional layer of depth you add to this, right? And that's really heap space, so you're running out of, of, of heap, which is usually much more serious than running out of, of, of stack space, because then your current threat just abandons mission. At, at depth 100, it is two to the power of 16 petabyte. I don't think anybody has that much storage space. Um, Okay, so I, I have to make another remark here. Going back to this, if you, if you call read object on the respective class, there's actually, again, some control mechanism that tries to figure out what the object that goes into this exception that is being to be constructed from the stream looks like. And again, there's a control that says, okay, it should actually be either a numerical value or a string. If it's an arbitrary object and there's a security manager, then we just throw a security exception. So the developer actually really, really thought about this, right? And if a security manager is set, you cannot relaunch this attack. However, there's a second flavor, and now it comes back to this argument I made earlier that real-world Java software, and not just Java software, .NET software, JavaScript software, and so on, is composed of libraries, of lots of libraries with deep transitive dependencies, and you don't really know what's going on in those libraries. The library we use here is the one that is probably even more common than Apache Commons collections, is Google Guava. Almost every Java program I know uses Google Guava. It's almost in the default setup for projects because it's full of really, really cool, useful, well-designed data structures. But it has this one flaw. I think I consider it as a flaw. It has a comparator that is a Java lingo for an object that is used to sort things, which uses two strings. So the idea is a pretty obvious one, and it sounds pretty benign. If you compare two objects, and you don't quite know what to do. It wouldn't be a good idea just to use it to string representation and then compare the strings. That sounds like a good default way of doing this. However, you can serialize this. And then you create a priority queue with this, and the priority queue works as follows. If you deserialize this, you deserialize all the objects, and then you say, well, hopefully whoever serialized this sorted it, but just in case we sort it again. So you call comparator to a string, and that's your entry point. And then you bypass the security manager. What is really funny about this, if you're a Java programmer, Priority Queue does this resorting on deserialization. Tree that doesn't. It's just an inconsistency. There's no good explanation for this. But it's probably just many, many developers working on this over a very long time. So abstracting a little bit from our findings and looking into other languages. So the ingredients we need to build this kind of attack or to create this kind of vulnerability are types that allow many to many references. Well, obviously, we have this because you have lists and sets. Yeah, and you can reference them for many points and they reference multiple objects. That is their very nature. So child recursive methods, what I simply mean is if you call hash code on an object and that knows other objects, it keeps on calling hash code on those objects. So we have seen it for hash code and for two string. Uh, resource monitoring methods, simply something like after you call a method, you need more system resources than before. That was the case with two strings. After you call two string, you need more memory because you have this long two string representations that have to fit into heap and suitable trampolines to trigger the call chains that create the, vulnerable, the vulnerabilities from uh, deserialization. Now we started looking into a couple of other languages. Uh, some observations here. We investigated Ruby, C Sharp, and JS. None of the languages was 
uh, has unbound stringify for standard collections, so it's this kind of monotonic behavior of two string, we found it only in Java. Ruby intercepts recursive hash calls, so Ruby inspects the stack on performance of certain methods and says, okay, that looks like it's a recursive course, it takes forever, so I just abandon this and come up with some sort of default. Very, very clever, so they do this, but very, very slow. Uh, JavaScript does not yet support proper hash maps. However, JavaScript 6 does, but they aren't serialized. If you try to serialize them with JSON, you just get an empty object. I think that is actually a flaw in JavaScript 6. It will be fixed eventually, and then we can start porting vulnerabilities once it's fixed. The same is true for .NET. We had a hard time porting the vulnerabilities to .NET, but then we found out that it's actually due to a bug in .NET. We found cases in .NET where the .NET core libraries break the contract between hash code and equals. That is one of the things you learn in Computing 101, right? If you have objects, if they are equal, they should have the same hash code, because otherwise your data structures are falling apart, and you don't find the right values if you look up with a certain key. That is the case in .NET. They accepted the bug, but they haven't really fixed it. Once they fix the bug, we can port more vulnerabilities to .NET. <laughs> okay, so here's a little bit of an overview. So we are partially successful in porting other stuff, but again, some of this is still up in the, up in the air. Uh, case studies. How am I doing? I have a little bit of time here. Uh, case studies. Uh, we used uh, two real web applications and servers and created a scenario. Maybe I explain this with the performance charts. So that is probably easier. So that is a standard Java web server with an application running on top of this, and the first one is Jenkins deployed on Tomcat. Tomcat 8, I think it is. And what we do here is we launch 100 benign requests. So we created a servlet that does a little bit of computing, and it takes about 100 milliseconds to perform its task, right? So that is normal as 100 milliseconds here. And then we hit it after 20 requests, first with five, and then with 500 malicious requests. Uh, the red one, this turtles all the way down. The green one is serial DOS, and the blue one is pufferfish. Please notice, I'm not quite sure whether you can see this, because the numbers are pretty tiny, that this is a logarithmic scale. So that is 100 milliseconds, that is normal, that is 1,000 milliseconds, that is 10,000 milliseconds. So you can see that the server recovers pretty easily, even in this case, from the turtle's attack, because it kills the threats handling the requests, but then the server realizes this and replaces the threads in this thread pool that is being used. It doesn't do very well with the pufferfish attack. So here, performance deteriorates by a factor of 100, but eventually will recover from this. That means that the threads handling requests run into out-of-memory errors, are then again culled and replaced by the thread pool, but it's far more expensive for the server to actually do this. For the serial DOS attack, you have a long-running Degradation of servers. It's not a denial of servers, more like degradation of servers, which in a way is even more evil. Because it, your, your server performance declines for a very long time, and you don't know how. Please also keep in mind if you have a tool to inspect this. And let's say you do thread dumps and you look what's going on in the computation, what functions are currently being executed. You see methods in the standard library being called. You know, like hash code and two string. I think I would be completely puzzled as an administrator if I would see something like this. So if you do this with 500 malicious requests now, you really kind of bring down your server and render it permanently unresponsive. <coughs> so we did this for JBoss as well, and the results are almost uh, identical. It's a slightly older version by JBoss, so the latest JBoss is not affected by this. And I should also maybe make a quick remark about the attack surfaces. So Jenkins has a remote CLI that uses serialization underneath, so we hijacked this. We wrote a special client that mimics the remote command line interface. Jenkins has, and uh, JBoss has a JMX surflet. So JMX is a monitoring protocol. You use standard monitoring tools like Visual VM, for instance, to connect with this protocol to running servers, and you can also uh, hijack this protocol to submit uh, serialized objects. We did some work on prevention and mitigation. So as I said, blacklisting and whitelisting is the most obvious thing to do, but it's not very effective for what we try to do, and it's simply because you use just classes from the standard uh, library. And uh, you could also suggest now to change the implementation of certain methods like to string, but uh, Java's were very conservative in changing methods that are so widely used in, because they don't want to break any backward compatibility. 
for existing clients, right? So we came up with uh, our own approach first, where we basically, and I have to keep this short a little bit because I'm running out of time, uh, inject pre and post conditions into existing code and the preconditions, basically you run deserialization and dedicated threads that is supervised by another thread. And the supervising thread can actually stop the computing thread deserializing if it figures out it's running for too long or it takes too much stack or too much heap space. And the way that is being done in Java and Java concurrent programming is you can just make a request, please terminate yourself instead of hard-coded termination. That is simply not, not, not possible anymore now in Java. So we set an inverse uh, from the supervising thread and the deserializing thread occasionally checks this and terminates itself with an exception. The post condition measures the resource usage. And basically, there's a very, very clever API. If, you, uh, if, if you're a hardcore Java programmer, you might actually like this in the EH cache library, where you can actually figure out what's a heap space, which is directly and indirectly referenced from an object on the stack is. You can actually measure this, right? And so we use this to compare memory usage against certain thresholds. And uh, we use aspect J to inject this kind of code into standard libraries because you actually have to modify existing libraries, uh, like standard uh, collections. And then we uh, run some experiments to assess the overhead, and that all went as expected. So I might just skip over this because I'm running out of time. But I'm happy to share more details if somebody's interested in this. Uh, some practical advice. Update the containers, so update the servers, use the latest one. Don't try to deserialize streams from untrusted sources. That advice has been made before. Use chap 290. That is uh, uh, a Java proposal that was fast-tracked and finished in 2017 and backported even to JDK 6. And what it does is you can, uh, with system properties to find type blacklists, whitelists, and you can also define parameters that restrict the stream, like maximum number of edges and maximum depth of those edges in order to prevent those attacks. And I think that is a very, very clever way of doing this and, and good on Oracle for fast tracking this and rolling this out so quickly. Related work, built in last, we already talked about this. Zip bombs are somehow similar, you know, deeply nested zips. If you deflate them, take a lot of memory, computational resources. Ruby symbols was an attack when you deserialized from JSON, it created a lot of symbols, and symbols used not to be garbage collected in Ruby. Now they are in response to this, because otherwise you would also eventually run out of memory with this attack. That is a very clever older attack on a proxy server, which also fits into this overall feature of algorithmic complexity attacks. The idea is you bombard a proxy server with objects that go into the cache, but all of those objects are different, but have the same hash code because it's open source, you understand the hash code function. And now suddenly, because you're all sitting in the same bucket in this hash structure, the lookup time deteriorates from constant to linear, so the proxy becomes more and more unresponsive, right? It's your, it's your insider knowledge of the algorithms being used by proxies over here that are being exploited in order to create those attacks. DARPA is American defense agencies. They currently have a, a research project that looks into vulnerabilities. Uh, in this class. Uh, there are a couple of links. Uh, there's, for instance, an artifact that has all the setup for all the experiments, all the compilers for the different vulnerabilities. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me. And the artifact is actually a virtual box image. You can just download this, install this, and then can you repeat and inspect and, and, and what have you. So only URL you really have to remember is the URL of this uh, presentation. It's tinyurl.com slash evil pickles. So that should be fairly straightforward. Uh, I would like to thank my sponsor. So I, I do a lot of research work actually on static analysis on the Java platform, and Oracle has been sponsoring it for years. And uh, this particular trip, our appearance, has been sponsored by Oracle New Zealand. And if you want to know more about the offerings, Tony and Jaco are sitting here, and they are more than happy to talk to you. Uh, a couple of other people I would like to thank. So the paper of the research project had a couple of collaborators from Message, that is Sean and Amjad, Alex Potanin from, from uh, Victoria and Kamil Jacek from the University of Western Bohemia, and a lot of other people who gave us feedback, money, or both. Right. And thank you.